Hello, good evening. Um, welcome everyone to what is uh, the last CESA public lecture of 2017. Uh, I'm Catherine, I'm from the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. Uh, we're based within the University of Cambridge. We focus on research on the identification, uh, management and mitigation of extreme risks. So these might be very low probability but very high impact risks. Um, so there's a small-ish research um, group, we're very interdisciplinary and we are very keen to have uh, good contacts with policy and technology communities in the work that we do. I've been asked to flag up, that as well as the public lectures, um, which will be uh, on YouTube, so that's all our public lectures will be av available on YouTube. We also have a Facebook page and a Twitter account that you can follow. Um, <laughs> But to get to the main purpose of this evening, I, I'm delighted to welcome Laura Khan. Uh, Laura Khan has a background in multiple areas, so nursing, medicine, public health, public policy, and currently works as a research scholar at the programme on science and global security at Princeton University. Uh, Laura is also a columnist for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, which is actually how I came across your work. Um, so two recent uh, major publications Laura's done. One is on um, public health crisis and leadership within public health crisis. And the more, most recent one is on One Health and the politics of antimicrobial resistance. So Laura was a founder of the One Health Initiative in the US, which works to increase communication and collaboration between professionals in human, animal, and environmental health. And in today's talk, she's going to be applying the One Health concept to analyse interrelationships between food security, the environment, and emerging diseases. So Laura's going to speak for, I think, about 40, 45 minutes, and we'll have a Q&A session afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me all OK? Oh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm always happy to travel to this side of the pond to visit your wonderful country, so thank you for inviting me. And I'm also very happy to talk about my favorite subject, One Health. Let's see, how does this, is this not one? There we go. One Health is very simply the concept that human, animal, and environmental health are linked. And you might think, well, that's obvious, isn't it? Well, actually, no. That's not usually how our institutions function. This concept that human, animal, and environmental health are linked can serve as a framework for systematically analyzing complex subjects, such as emerging infectious diseases, food safety and security, antimicrobial resistance, and even chronic diseases. This website that my One Health colleagues and I uh, run has been serving as a global repository for all news and information pertaining to One Health since 2008. My colleague, Dr. Bruce Kaplan, is a retired veterinarian, and he lives and breathes for this website. So he uh, tracks our visitors, so please visit our website often. Tell your friends and family about it because I want to make Bruce happy. So, uh, so, so he can send us an email and tell us that our traffic has gone up. So thank you for spreading the word on our website. Now this concept is relatively, or this term One Health is relatively new, but the concept is actually quite ancient. And you can even go back all the way to Hippocrates, who recognized that when people went to low-lying swampy areas, they would often get sick with fevers, and indeed, the term malaria literally means bad air. And it would take a couple thousand years before scientists could figure out that insects could transmit disease. And I will be talking a bit about that later in this talk. Now, the domestication of plants and animals took a long time to happen. But without it, we would not have agriculture uh, and we would not have civilization. Agriculture began around 10,000 years ago, and the food security that it provided allowed the foundation and continuation of towns, cities, and nations to develop because the food supply was stable. This is a timeline of the temperature of the planet since complex life began. What's so striking about this timeline is this is the ice age, Agriculture did not develop during the Ice Age for the simple reason that the planet was too cold. 
at the end of the ice age, the temperature of the planet began to warm up to about here, about 10,000 years. And this entire duration is human civilization. Human civilization has uh, continued because the climate has allowed it. There was a little blip here. There's, of course, been some variation. There was a little blip here that came off this baseline of the little ice age. And artists at the time documented what the little ice age looked like. So you can see here, during the period from 1300 to around 1850, the Thames used to freeze over, and they would actually have frost fairs for a couple hundred years fairs on the Thames, ice skating on the main canal in Rotterdam, and this is a painting by Peter Bruegel, a Flemish painter who uh, documented the frozen wasteland uh, in that region. It's important to note that the Little Ice Age was noted for crop failures, famines, and bread riots because the, the, the climate was too cold and uh, food security diminished. Now, when we talk about the increase of the planet, we've, in, we've now gone off this baseline by about one degree. We're hoping to keep the temperature below two degrees. Two degrees might not seem like much, but if you go back to the temperature back here during the Paleozoic or Cenozoic era, yeah, the temperature of the planet was around two degrees, but uh, there was, well, humanity didn't exist. It was a very different planet. It was a very hot planet, and you even had palm trees in Antarctica. Not good for agriculture, not good for food security. So I would argue then that uh, the temperature of the, the climate jeopardizes civilization. Now, some people might say, well, I live in the middle of the country. I don't care if Florida or Bangladesh go underwater. I mean, it's not my problem. Well, food is everybody's, everybody's concerned about food because everybody has to eat. So this is the existential threat. Yes, yeah, there will be parts of the planet that go underwater, and if you don't live in the coast, then you're not going to care, but everyone should care about food. And once we get off this baseline enough, you saw what happened with the Little Ice Age, this should serve as a cautionary tale to everybody. Now, in the United States, we've been very fortunate since the end of World War II. The cost of food has diminished, and the, dis uh, the percent of disposable income that Americans have had to pay for food has gone down to less than 10%. And indeed, Americans spend less on food than any other country on the planet, but have no fear, you're right next door, this is Great Britain, um, and I would argue that our entire consumer economy depends on having relatively inexpensive food. Because if you're spending all of your money on food, like they do in Nigeria, where they're spending almost 60% of their income on food, then there's no money left over to spend on the gizmos and gadgets and iPods and iPads that uh, your country wants you to buy to keep the engine of the economy going. So inexpensive food is extremely important. So we face a number of food security challenges in the 21st century. Climate change certainly uh, will have an impact on food production. We don't know how bad it could be. It could be very bad. So the question then becomes, well, what policies can governments implement to maximize food security or the prevention of hunger and food safety? Governments have an incentive to ensure food security to minimize the uh, risk of uh, civil unrest or even revolution. Let's not forget that uh, the Syrian civil war was preceded by about three years of a devastating drought, leading to a collapse of agriculture and food security in that country. And you could argue then that the Syrian refugee crisis is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, of uh, climate refugees that will be confronted by uh, the rest of the world. So the question then is how can everyone be fed without destroying the planet's biosphere or the global sum of all ecosystems? 
This is a uh, hunger map by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. And you can see that Africa has a lot of areas of food insecurity. There's even some places now that are becoming too hot to grow their food. It's also a problem in South Asia and uh, other regions of the world. Now, even though the U.S. spends less on food than any other country, we still have a lot of hungry people, particularly in the poor regions of Appalachia. There's a lot of food insecurity, and these areas have not really recovered since the Great Recession of 2008. I was curious about the hunger situation here in Great Britain, and uh, I must say, when I was searching your government's website, it's quite opaque and not easy to find data, so I had to resort to Google, and this is what I came up with. Uh, I'm not sure it's government, uh, Statistica, but um, it does provide data on the number of food banks where people are hungry in your country. So even though uh, food is relatively cheap in the United States and in Great Britain, there's still a lot of food insecure, hungry people. Now, if the climate, uh, if the emissions uh, that are causing climate change are not reduced, um, some climate models predict that by 2050, much of the world is going to be simply too hot and too dry to grow food. And that will lead to a collapse of civilization. Then you will see billions of people migrating north in search of uh, more habitable climates and food. This will cause an enormous humanitarian crisis. And hopefully, we can prevent this from happening. Just a quick uh, note of the difference when I talk about food safety versus food security. I think we can all agree that this apple doesn't look particularly appetizing, and I don't think anybody would want to eat it. So food safety is basically food free from harmful bacteria, viruses, parasites, or other chemical substances versus food security, which is, in essence, an agricultural term in preventing hunger. Now let me turn uh, now to discussing a bit about newly emerging diseases, the, the rate of which started really beginning around the middle of the 20th century. Why are these diseases emerging? Increasing global population pressures. Certainly there's over 7 billion of us now on the planet. Widespread deforestation for agriculture, environmental destruction, intensive agriculture, livestock and bushmeat or wild animal consumption. I'm going to talk uh, more about this. Global trade and travel, and probably climate change. There's been a lot of deforestation for expanding agriculture to feed our growing global population, uh, and that is not good for, um, for the planet in terms of the atmosphere or for the emergence of diseases. Now, where are these diseases emerging from? They, they have to be emerging from somewhere. And in most cases, they're emerging from animals, both wild and domestic, uh, bats, rodents, monkeys. Um, but there's also domestic uh, emergence, and I'm sure you're familiar with mad cow disease or bovine spongiform encephalopathy that began here in the 1980s. Um, the term zoonosis means a disease of animals that jumps into humans. And about 75% of these diseases are, in fact, zoonosis. So for bats, you've got SARS and Nipah, probably Ebola, Hendra, and certainly rabies. Rodents, you've got leptospirosis, hantavirus, plague, and a number of others. And then monkeys, you've also uh, importantly developed uh, HIV, certainly jumped from monkeys. So zoonoses are diseases of animals that can spread to people. That can include viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites, or prions. I'm, in this talk, going to focus on viruses. Now, I'm going to assume that some of you 
do not have a biology background. For those of you who do, my apologies, but I think it's important to understand what exactly a virus is and how it differs from a bacteria. Uh, a virus is basically a protein coat with genetic material inside versus a bacteria, which is a complete organism uh, that um, can uh, take in nourishment, produce waste, and can reproduce by itself. Viruses, as I said, are just simply a protein coat with some genetic material, and it's technically not alive. And why is that, you might ask? Well, they are parasites. They cannot reproduce by themselves. They have to attack a cell, whether it's a human cell, a bacteria, or some other animal cell. They attach to the cell. They inject their genetic material into it, whether it's RNA or DNA. They then hijack the cell's machinery to produce more viruses and then they burst out, ready to infect the next cell. So they are technically not alive, but no science fiction writer could come up with a more bizarre bioform than what viruses already are. And so because viruses are technically not alive, that means that antibiotics do not work. Now, antibiotics strictly work against bacteria, they either stun the bacteria or they kill the bacteria to allow your immune system to clear them out. So because they cannot be killed, antibiotics do not work. Antivirals work, but not that well. At most, what they can do is block the virus from either entering the cell, block the machinery of making new viruses, or block its ability to burst out of the host cell. The best option then for this, for viruses, is really vaccination. Uh, vaccination. Vaccines are essentially weakened or deactivated viruses, and they work by priming the immune system to fight invasion. So it's basically practice for your immune system. You inject either a piece of the virus or a weakened or deactivated virus uh, into your body, and it serves as boot camp or practice for your immune system so that when it actually does encounter the real pathogen, it will be ready. It goes, oh, well, I know what this is. I've seen this before. I know exactly what to do. And then it can uh, keep your body from completely succumbing to this deadly virus. So viruses are very sneaky because what they do, they need to get out of your body in order to infect the next body. So they either make you cough or sneeze or have diarrhea uh, or sexually transmitted. They want your body to uh, erupt and to get out as much of the virus particle as it can. Um, Ebola usually spreads by droplet. Measles are extremely uh, infective. You just have to walk into a room with somebody with measles and you're exposed. So different viruses have different strategies to get out, and your signs and symptoms depend on what kind of virus you have and how they're trying to get out of your body. Viruses can also spread in other ways, uh, mosquitoes and other insects, contaminated water and food, blood and bodily fluids, and even contaminated surfaces uh, with influenza, for example, can stay on a contaminated doorknob for about three days. I have my kids maniacally using hand gel whenever there's an outbreak going on because I don't want them to bring it home. So how does agriculture then fit into this whole picture of zoonotic diseases? Well, food animals, particularly li uh, livestock, help these microbes jump from wild animals into humans. In 2012, a World Bank study found that 11 major pandemics um, have a that have afflicted the world since the 80s uh, have involved domesticated food animals. But it's important to note that the diseases jumping from domesticated animals to humans is not a new phenomenon. This has been going on since the dawn of agriculture. Um, so while agriculture has provided a uh, secure food supply and allowed the uh, evolution and persistence of civilization, it has come with a price, and that includes diseases, including measles, that almost certainly 
evolved from rinderpest, which is a disease of cattle. And by the way, rinderpest is now the second disease to have been eradicated um, after smallpox. So that was a, a major uh, accomplishment by the global agriculture community, unfortunately underreported and underappreciated. Brucellosis from goats and sheep, Q fever, tularemia is rabbit fever, and of course, mad cow from cattle. There are an increasing number of domestic animals and humans on the planet. About 96 to 98 percent of the planet's mammalian zoo mass is now made up of domesticated animals and humans. There's approximately 40 billion food animals providing milk, meat, eggs to an ever-growing human population. And these intensive livestock systems provide excellent conditions for disease transmission when you've got thousands of birds, uh, sheep, and fish congregated together. That is an excellent setup for disease transmission. Now, unfortunately, without agriculture, that doesn't mean you're clear and free. There's other diseases associated with eating wild animals, and that includes HIV, AIDS, SARS, MERS, Ebola, and who knows what else is next. So then we have to kind of weigh our poison. Which one do you want? Do you want the, the known livestock-associated diseases, or do you want the danger of the newly emerging diseases from bushmeat? And many parts of the world rely on bushmeat. Uh, this is an African bushmeat market. And this is fruit bats for sale in the Dem uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And of course, in Asia as well, bushmeat for sale in Laos. I was really stunned to hear that there's actually uh, bushmeat for sale in the United States uh, from a, a, um, a USDA official. I was not aware of that, but we have a lot of immigrants in the United States, and they like to bring their food uh, cultural practices with them. So um, don't know what's going on in this country, but certainly this isn't restricted to just developing countries. Now you might say, oh, well, the answer is simple. We all become vegetarian. Well, it's not so simple as that. And in fact, some people have argued that we are human because we hunted, cooked, and ate meat. And you can look at our anatomy and physiology um, how we evolved, our GI tracts, gastrointestinal tracts, are approximately 40% smaller than they should be for a primate our size. Our brains are much larger than other primates, and I challenge you all to fast for 24 hours and see how well you study after uh, fasting. It's not easy. Um, the human, human diet, then, evolved to include energy-dense, easily digestible food including seeds, nuts, and cooked meat. My veterinarian colleagues like to call gorillas the cows of the primate world. And if you look, compare their anatomy and physiology to humans, they've got these enormous guts. Uh, they spend basically their entire day chewing low energy dense foods and just resting and belching and flatulating uh, basically their entire entire existence. Uh, in contrast, we have a relatively small gut and a large brain were designed to run and hunt. Let's turn now to mosquito-borne diseases. Mosquitoes are the most dangerous creature on the planet. They kill hundreds of thousands of humans, even more than your fellow humans, and even more than snakes. Um, they are actually fascinating creatures. They are ancient. And there's some specimens uh, that were found in Cretaceous Canadian amber up to 79 million years old. Um, some feed on birds and monkeys and rainforest canopies, others on ground-dwelling mammals, some even on amphibians and reptiles. And I was surprised to learn that crocodiles can get sick from West Nile virus. There's more than 3,500 species. In the US, there's over 176. I'm not sure how many there are here. Um, but an increasing number of species have adapted to humans, unfortunately. 
I was mentioned earlier about the discovery that insects could transmit disease, and this uh, happened with, uh, well, Dr. Carlos Finlay, a Cuban physician, had proposed that the Aedes mosquito could transmit yellow fever. Uh, Dr. Walter Reed um, carried out the experiments to show it, where they were deliberately trying to infect human volunteers with yellow fever. I am sure it would not be approved by any human subject uh, review board today, but nevertheless, they did succeed in infecting um, volunteers, including one of the other researchers, with yellow fever. Uh, and that was a monumental discovery that insects could indeed uh, transmit disease. It's important to know your foe's life, life cycle. Some, such as the Culex pipians mosquitoes, lay their eggs on little boats, and when they uh, hatch, they form these larvae with a little uh, breathing tube, like a snorkel, at the top, and then they form into a pupil before uh, emerging as an adult. The most effective time to uh, do mosquito control is actually in this egg larvae stage where you can apply uh, larvicides to the water or you can have larvae eating fish in the water. Um, by the time they get to be adults, it's much, much harder to kill them. And so when you see the government with the trucks or the helicopters spraying pesticides around, it's basically just to, for show. I mean, it's just to show the public that they're trying to do something, but it's really by that time, it's pretty ineffective. Um, really, the time to, do, to get rid of mosquitoes is at this stage. But not all mosquitoes uh, rely on water. Some uh, lay their eggs on walls, but many of them lay their eggs in the water. Different mosquitoes transmit different diseases. So the Aedes, Aedes aegypti and Albopictus, or the Asian tiger mosquito, spread chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika. The Anopheles gambii, malaria, and filariasis. And the Culex pipians mosquito, or the house mosquito that we know and love in America, spread avian malaria, filariasis, Japanese encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, and West Nile virus. And keep this in mind, um, I will be talking about this uh, soon. Now, unfortunately, um, the Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquito, got a toehold into the United States, probably through the shipment of infected tires. Uh, and they were able to spread. They came from Asia. Um, and uh, they've become a real problem in addition to the Aedes aegypti. Both of these are invasive species in the United States. Now the question is, well, what about Europe? There are some places in Europe that have Aedes aegypti, and the tiger mosquito has made a, has made a, a move here in southern Europe. Are you free and clear here in the United, in the United Kingdom? Well, I did a search, and I found this one paper the discovery of a single male Aedes aegypti in Merseyside. I don't know where that is. Oh, we're somewhere around here, England. So uh, never say never here in the United Kingdom. As the planet warms, uh, you might be getting an unwelcome visitor sometime in the near future. And this is what the paper showed in the, uh, in the article uh, reporting its finding. Unfortunately, as I said, um, used tires, they're a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. Once you get a little bit of water into a used tire, it's virtually impossible to get it out. And mosquitoes love them. They're perfect breeding grounds. And so if you find yourself in a place like this, the, the air is usually just a cloud of mosquitoes uh, because there's just, they just thrive in this kind of environment. Um, there's certainly been cases of mosquitoes hijacking aboard uh, uh, planes um, going to new areas. Um, unfortunately, deforestation, largely for agriculture, we've seen a lot of that. That helps to promote then the spread of uh, mosquito-borne diseases and the shipping typically of used tires um, is another huge problem. So that brings me now to the 1999 West Nile virus outbreak of New York City. Is anybody familiar with this outbreak? 
Oh, great, none of you are. Okay, so um, New York City is uh, divided into five boroughs. There's the island of Manhattan, uh, and then to the south is Staten Island. To the east is Queens and uh, Brooklyn, and to the north is the Bronx. Um, in the spring of 1999, uh, thousands of crows started exhibiting strange behavior in the borough of Queens, which was over here on the side. Um, thousands of them were uh, walking funny, showing weird head movements, and then keeling over and dying. And a lot of the residents of Queens didn't know what to make of this, and some of them brought the dead crows to their local veterinarian, figuring that the veterinarian would know what to do. The veterinarian had no clue. So usually what they did was they sent the dead birds up to the, um, the state uh, uh, environmental lab up in Albany, uh, upstate New York, they didn't know what to do with it, so they just kind of stored them in drawers or freezers uh, and just held on to them. So about a month later, peop uh, people started getting sick in Queens. Um, people were exhibiting abnormal neurologic behavior, uh, muscle weakness, paralysis, headaches, um, neuro severe neurologic symptoms that were not too dissimilar from what the birds were examining. So you had two simultaneous outbreaks going on, one in the birds and the other animals, and then now just uh, starting to see humans coming down with it. And uh, the working diagnosis at that time was St. Louis encephalitis. As you saw, Culex pipians can spread St. Louis encephalitis. It is endemic in the Americas. And when you, there's a, th a saying in medicine, when you hear hoof beats, you think horses, not zebras. And so the, the horse would typically be St. Louis encephalitis. About a month after the humans started getting sick, um, the virus traveled up to the Bronx. Uh, and that's where the Bronx Zoo is. And Dr. Tracy McNamara was the chief veterinary pathologist at the Bronx Zoo. And she was very concerned because some of her birds were starting to get sick and dying. She was doing necropsies, which is the veterinary equivalent to autopsies, and she was seeing horrific hemorrhagic encephalitis, myocarditis, bleeding around the heart and around the brain, and she started getting scared. Now, what was really strange about this was the working diagnosis was St. Louis encephalitis, and if that were the case, then the birds that were native to the Americas should have been immune because the disease is endemic in the Americas, and the birds that were from Europe and, um, and from Africa should have been getting sick and dying. But in fact, the exact opposite was happening. The birds that were native to the Americas were getting sick and dying, and the birds that were native to Europe and to Africa were fine. So something strange was happening, and she knew that because the birds with the different susceptibilities weren't doing what they were expected to do, uh, she knew that something new was happening. So she called the CDC and she said, you know, I'm Dr. Matt Nac McNamara from the Bronx Zoo and I've got some bird specimens that I think could be an important clue to this outbreak that's going on in people uh, in Queens. And the CDC said, well, you're a veterinarian. We don't care about animals. We only deal with, uh, with humans. So why don't you send your bird specimens to Ames, Iowa and stop bothering us? Click. Well, any of you who know Dr. McNamara, she take, doesn't take no for an answer, and so she called up a friend of hers who was at the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute for Infectious Diseases, and he accepted the bird specimens. Meanwhile, the, um, the lab in Albany, New York, sent their birds to a researcher out in California, and then a race went on between USAMRIT and UC Irvine as to who could identify the new agent. And it was a shock when they discovered for the first time that West Nile virus, a virus never seen in North America before, um, sh suddenly showed up. Um, so the veterinarian cracked the case, but she was ignored. Now, the CDC had egg on its face, and to its credit, since then it has established a One Health office headed by a veterinarian. Um, so, and they established a West Nile virus monitoring system, and they were able to follow in real time the virus's spread 
across the United States. Now it's important also to know that in the 10 years before West Nile virus appeared, New York City had basically eliminated its mosquito control program. The reason why they did that? Well, the success of public health is the absence of disease. So if there's no disease, the uh, elected officials look around, they're always trying to cut funding, cut their budget. They figure, well, if there's no disease, there's no problem, so let's cut it. It's kind of like having a seawall to keep the ocean out. We're not flooded, so let's just knock down the wall because we don't need it anymore because there's no flooding. So of course, you knock down your seawall and the ocean comes roaring in. It doesn't mean that the ocean is gone. It just means that you're holding it back. And that's the same thing with public health. It's not like the diseases have gone away. You're just controlling them. But trying to convince elected officials who are always trying to cut funding that, well, we don't see the disease because we're funding preventive efforts, uh, that is always a struggle. So that's what we saw with West Nile virus. And trying to develop policies to, you know, to prevent it, um, they were sending trucks around spraying all of Queens. It was a complete waste of time. They should have been doing, over the 10 years, uh, the larva size and the careful uh, mosquito control efforts that might have kept West Nile virus out. Now let's quickly turn to the Zika virus because that's been ravaging Brazil and uh, more recently Puerto Rico and the southern parts of the United States. First discovered in April of 1947 in the Zika forest in Uganda. A rhesus monkey got sick during a research study on yellow fever. Um, it was a relatively obscure virus that stayed in the equatorial region of Africa and Asia for decades. Host animals were typically monkeys. And unfortunately, in April of 2007, it appeared on Yap Island in Micronesia. We have no idea how that happened. But then, seven years later, Brazil experienced an explosive Zika virus epidemic. Now, for most adults, Zika virus was kind of a minor illness. You get red eyes, diarrhea, headache, aches and pains, a rash, and a fever. But generally, you were fine after several days. Unfortunately, if you were pregnant at a critical time when you come down with these, uh, your baby uh, could be permanently damaged with microcephaly. And instead of the normal size head, the head was uh, very small and the brain abnormally developed. This is a CT scan of a baby with microcephaly, and basically the brain just stopped developing. Total lifetime cost for such an individual, anywhere from one to $10 million, absolutely devastating for Brazil um, to have this kind of epidemic in its midst. Interestingly, there was a study out of China it shows that uh, evidence of a single mutation in the Zika virus might be contributing to the microcephaly in babies, so it doesn't take much. In adults, some unfortunate adults develop a Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is basically the immune system attacking the nervous system, causing total paralysis. Um, we often don't know what's, um, what it could be due to, sometimes infection, very rarely a vaccination. Remember, vaccination is basically trying to prime the immune system to prepare for uh, an infection. Uh, sometimes it goes awry. But in most cases, Guillain-Barre, the cause is unknown. But they have noticed that Zika viruses have triggered it. And there's about one to two cases per 100,000 people in the, in the US each year of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Unfortunately, there's no specific antiviral medications available at this time, no vaccine, so the treatment is strictly supportive. And the best strategy is mosquito control, particularly larvicides, um, doing something with used tires. Don't leave them in those huge piles that you often see in certain countries. Uh, sanitation, wearing protective clothing, screen and doors, and insect repellent. This is the global virus distribution of the Zika virus, and unfortunately, again, now it's in Brazil and in parts of the Caribbean.
as well as Mexico. And we've had a few cases in Florida. So then the issue of climate change and vector-borne diseases. Uh, arthropods, insects transmit many diseases, very sensitive to temperature changes, and they thrive in warm tropical climates, which isn't good for us. Malaria and dengue are being now reported at higher elevations around the world, so we must anticipate then more emergence and spread of these diseases. So we rely on agriculture then for a safe and secure food supply. Food safety and security are the foundation of civilization, yet intensive agriculture comes with risks and contributing to the emergence of disease through deforestation, environmental degradation, contamination, and even potentially greenhouse gas emissions through methane and nitrous oxide emissions. So the challenge that we face in the 21st century is figuring out how to sustainably feed ourselves, maintain our civilization without completely destroying the natural world. Uh, so we need to integrate our efforts using a One Health approach uh, to benefit both humans, animals, and the environment, looking at this in a systematic way um, uh, through a One Health approach. Because if you only focus on the humans, you're missing a large part of the picture. Uh, and I would just like to conclude by acknowledging my collaborators, Bruce Kaplan, Tom Monath, Lisa Conti, our One Health Initiative website. Please visit it often and tell your friends and colleagues about it. And I would like to thank you for your time and attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Laura, for that fascinating, uh, if somewhat disturbing, talk. Um, we, we now have um, half an hour or, or a little bit more for, for questions. I'm, I'm going to field questions in the usual way. That is, I'll, I'll, I'll keep a, a mental cue, so if people want to ask questions, please raise your hand and um, I'll, um, I'll call on you. Um, would someone like to start? Yes. yes. Um, could you say something about um, uh, reinforcing the, 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 the food supply chain, you know, how to make us more resilient in, in that respect? Because, you know, in Britain we, we, we grow not more than 50% of our food, I think, and um, also, um, you know, we, we need deliveries from other parts of the world, and it might indeed be interrupted during Brexit to some extent, and, uh, and so on. Um, so, so how do we, we make ourselves more resilient? Say, say part of Europe uh, is subject to a tsunami and, uh, 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 and is no longer able to supply us. Well, certainly addressing food waste. There's a lot of food waste in the system. So trying to reduce that uh, would be one strategy. Yes, you're right, the food supply has become international and some countries are much more reliant on uh, having food imported than others. Um, I think the Netherlands actually could serve as an interesting model because they do now a lot of indoor agriculture. And so that might be, I mean, unfortunately, that's also very energy intensive, but um, growing your own food indoors might be a way to get around some of the, um, some of the challenges of importation that would probably make food fairly expensive which is not really going to help food security in the long run, particularly for the poor. So countries that rely on a lot of food importation are going to have to come up with strategies on how to grow their own food, become more food uh, self-reliant, and develop you know, trading partners that are um, reliable and consistent. Uh, but it's going to be hard in a warming planet uh, to, find, to find that. It's not going to be. There's no simple, easy answer, uh, neither for crop agriculture nor animal agriculture. Um, just at the back there. That's a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm particularly interested in the history of diseases. And I love your, your starting with mal area on Hippocrates. And then you allude to the Little Ice Age. And I suppose one anomaly, or needs explaining still, um, is that in the UK and parts of northwestern Europe, malaria was a serious problem. 
during the so-called Little Ice Age. So, you know, there is this question now, if global warming will malaria come back? But obviously it, it, it's a very much more complicated story and links up with social, economic, environmental issues. Um, but, but a very small point about the decline or, the, or let's say, the disappearance of malaria in, in the UK. Um, one factor, which seems small, but possibly important with your interest in, in um, the link between humans and animals, was that pe people lived close to their domestic cattle, <coughs> cheek by jowl. So our, our mosquitoes are um, zoophilic, so they prefer cattle to humans, but you know, if you've got blood from both, they skip from one. And, and one possible um, explanation, as I say, one of many, is that by improving <coughs> housing in rural areas, then the separation of animals and humans meant that our zoophilic Anopheles atropagus actually went to the cattle. So, so there's m so many. I mean, I love the way you you express the fact that you know these these links between humans, <coughs> animals, domesticated or wild go back a long, long way. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, there was often question, well, you know, we had malaria in the United States as well. It was a serious problem. In fact, New Jersey, where I'm living now, was called the Mosquito State, and some prominent people died from malaria. Well, we drained the swamps, and a lot of development, you pave over a lot of mosquito habitat. Just economic development seemed to help uh, get rid of it. The Centers for Disease Control was actually founded to address malaria. So um, there really was no one thing that you know, reduced the malaria. It was probably economic development, environmental you know, development um, contributed to all of that. But certainly screen doors and you know, affluence, increasing affluence to be able to afford these things um, certainly helped. And uh, you know, uh, developing countries, I mean, I didn't show any images of that, but if you've got uh, streams of sewage, uh, no sanitation, heaps of used tires. I mean, there's all these things that could be addressed to help reduce the incidence, but it takes political will, it takes funding, uh, and it takes, you know, public support to get all of this done. And that's sometimes easier said than done. Um, so... I think those um, mosquito-borne diseases are very, very... Very common, yes. Well, they kill more humans than any other creature on the planet, so they are, they are a formidable foe. <laughs> um, Jane. Uh, and just to pick up on the, on the um, food security issue, I mean, you, you, you passed pretty rapidly over the idea of um, going to plant-based diet. But, but I, mean, I mean, it's not an all or nothing matter. One, we could go to a less meat intensive diet. I mean, so I'm uh, interested in your comments on uh, uh, the social acceptability of that. And sure. The yes, thank so you on. for but, that but, question. But, but also the health aspect. I mean, there seem to be two, right. two things. I and mean, what's, what's your thought about right. at least shifting, well, shifting uh, things somewhat? Right. Well, right. of all the countries on the planet, the country with the most uh, vegetarians is India. India, and even there, uh, it's about 30 or 40 percent, uh, and that's because the Hindu religion mandates being a vegetarian. There is no greater uh, motivator, behavioral motivator, than religion. Um, but many of the Abrahamic religions are based on eating food. You've got the Paschal lamb, the Christmas ham or turkey, the Thanksgiving, well, Thanksgiving is a non-denominational holiday, but you get the point that many of these religions are centered around animal agriculture and the consumption of food animals. So um, one strategy then would be to somehow modify that to get the religion to promote uh, vegetarianism, but that's not easy to do. Um, so, you know, Consumption of meat, I have a slide, it's actually going up in India, even though a sizable fraction of their population is vegetarian. So I think there is very strong social, religious, and cultural uh, uh, trends against going vegetarian. That's not to say that it can't change sometime in the future as these problems continue, but it has to be examined 
and uh, understood and addressed. You'd have to have a public who's willing to go along with that. And quite frankly, when I go to the middle of the country in the U.S., they are eating three meals, meat three meals a day, and they are very adamant about being able to eat their meat three meals a day. The other thing I would like to just mention is that in 1948, the United Nations claimed or stated that food is a human right. They didn't uh, claim, they didn't state which kind of food. So they didn't say, is meat a human right? Then you would have to step back and examine, well, is a meat-rich diet, and I'm not talking about meat with every meal, is a meat-rich diet a human right? I actually asked the U.S. ambassador to the FAO this question, and he said, and I said, when you provide food in a humanitarian crisis, are you giving them meat? And he said, no, we're giving them cereals, grains. That's generally the food that they get. So we are, as we produce intensive agriculture, we are working, I think, under the assumption that meat is a human right. We're providing affordable meat for the poor to be able to eat it. Now, if you look in historically at, through Europe, it was usually only the very wealthy who could afford meat, and the peasants afforded gruel, maybe vegetables, maybe meat once in a, once in a while, but they certainly didn't eat a meat-rich diet. So perhaps as a global community, we need to decide, is meat a, a human right, a meat-rich diet a human right, or should it only be available to the wealthy? I wonder how well that's going to go over. Um, and I don't think any politician's really going to want to touch it. So we're going to kind of continue on our way until there's enough demand that, you know, we change our practices. But again, that's going to require political, religious, and cultural changes that I'm not sure, you know, the global community, certainly many uh, countries, peoples, are going to be willing to give up. Could I go ahead? Go on. I mean, you offer two options. One is vegetarianism, one is the meat rich diet. But there seem to be lots of options in between. Sure. Which is the low meat diet. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and it seems to me that that's culturally could yeah. become far, quite rapidly, very generally, well, it's certainly more chance of, of, of making that generally popular. And I think the idea of flexitarianism and these kinds of things seem to me to uh, be absolutely. catching Absolutely. So, so, yeah. uh, so I, I would I'm using the extremes that, as an example. And certainly you can live a fine life as a vegetarian, provided you get enough protein and the micronutrients that meat provides. Uh, if you don't, you develop protein malnutrition. So yes, you can eat a low meat diet, and that's fine. Uh, the challenge, again, is getting the public to be willing to do that. And that requires <laughs> cultural and religious changes. Because, well, it, it, those are the strongest uh, behavioral motivi motivators, if you will, than anything else. Um, I think. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I'm never going to use tire the same way. Um, I was just wondering. So you talked about emerging zoonotic diseases. I was wondering um, about uh, like crop health. So have there been emerging like crop diseases in the last? Um, I think you said it was since the 80s that it's really increased. Has there ever been? Yeah, I mean we have been seeing more. I haven't studied it to the extent that I have with animal diseases, and certainly we're seeing invasive species in the United States coming in, wrecking havoc on the uh, crop agriculture. So it certainly is a problem. And you know you've got the mildews and the rusts, and they like a warmer climate. So one could then anticipate or that more would probably happen. And that would be a huge problem because not only for our own direct consumption, but for the food animals as well, because everybody relies on the crops. If I may just ask a follow-up, um, uh, bioweapon programs, do you know if they're um, you know, the historic ones, did they look into crop disease or were they more like? It was more against livestock. Um, Glanders certainly was one, and that's against livestock. Um, I don't recall anything specific. Well, Agent Orange was an anti-foliage that the U.S. used in Vietnam. One could argue that was a form of bioterrorism with a chemical weapon, actually. Yeah. Uh, the person at the far corner there. 
just wonder if you could comment more on the introduction of West Nile into New York. I mean, you kind of suggested it was linked to uh, the cutbacks in, in mosquito control, but is that the only thing that led? No, thank you for that question. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Richard Preston, who's a reporter, writer with The New Yorker, he wrote a column speculating that it might have been bioterrorism, actually. And in fact, Saddam Hussein had once threatened to use West Nile virus against the United States. So that was thrown out there, but nobody can prove one way or the other. Uh, but it certainly, there was the cutback in mosquito control. Uh, that certainly was happened. So whether the mosquitoes were introduced deliberately or accidentally, we have no idea. So I, I didn't go into that because I just didn't know. So uh, your question helped bring that up. Good. Thank you. Um, thanks, Andy. Enjoy that in a scary kind of way. <laughs> um, and what, what strikes me when you, you're talking to some extent about the symptoms of a, what, the way we live, the highly intensive, globalizing, connecting, and so on. Um, and I, the question is really about the way public health is framed in, in that, from that kind of perspective of globally uh, and, and, and kind of highly concentrated activity. It seems to me there's a bit of a shortfall in the framing of public health. And yes. I'd like to comment on that. Thank you very much. Well, those of us in One Health are hoping to get One Health more implemented into schools of public health because schools of public health only focus on humans, human health. And, you know, that made sense during the uh, 20th century. You know, a lot of people were dying from a variety of preventable diseases. Um, increased sanitation has certainly helped, vaccination, food safety, all of those things. And I would argue that public health has been very successful. There's 7 billion plus of us on the planet. Now we're being confronted by these new challenges. We need to change our paradigm in order to address them to be able to continue civilization. Uh, and that then requires looking beyond just the needs of humans and looking at the needs of wildlife and, uh, and whole ecosystems, a, a one health approach, if you will, because we must recognize that our health relies on the health of our environment. We don't live in a vacuum. We, have, we live in a milieu that includes animals and trees and other plants and, and everything else. So by expanding the scope of public health into One Health, hopefully we can start addressing more of these wicked issues in a more interdisciplinary way than what we've been doing. But that's easier said than done. I've written a number of papers that have been rejected because public health really doesn't want to change what they're doing. It's hard to make changes. Uh, and, you know, we need to get teachers and textbooks and, I mean, you really need to develop a whole new field. Uh, and that, you know, you have to overcome inertia. But let's not forget it took over a century to implement basic sanitation uh, in Western Europe and in the United States. Basic sanitation took a century. So these things, you know, we're planting the seeds, but it's not really going to probably take fruit until, you know, sometime down the line. One of the problems with going to these lectures is you wonder whether you've got a century left. <laughs> well, that's a good point. <laughs> so <laughs> let's hope we get it implemented sooner. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Sure. So it seems to me that climate change might play prominent role in grasping the complexities is how these systems interact. And you said drain the swamp, um, I think in a different context, but nonetheless, uh, the new US administration, how much a setback is this for adopting an approach like the one you're setting up here in the US context that you just mentioned? I was anticipating a question like that, yeah. well. Uh, those of us who did not vote for the current administration are quite devastated by it, and it is a huge step backwards as we watch our Environmental Protection Agency and all the rules and regulations being scaled back to uh, bring us back decades, reverse decades of progress. Um, 
it, you know, it was a political hit. Uh, we have serious political problems in our country that hopefully we can overcome. Um, there is no one easy answer to that. And those of us who are trying to uh, turn Congress more democratic than, you know, conservative. And let's not forget that um, the conservative movement, a lot of it, and I, I was just reading this article on the flight over here in the New Yorker, an old article, um, that um, many of the uh, owners of oil companies are actually funding, you know, these conservative radical movements because they don't want to curtail their income from the oil industry. So really, we are all kind of at the mercy of the oil industry, and we have to get at the root of the problem. Um, and doing that is going to require collaboration with everybody. If you've got a population that's busy fighting with each other, they're not going to join forces and get rid of the actual bad guys. Um, but that's what they've succeeded in doing, is creating a lot of domestic turmoil, fighting amongst ourselves, rather than addressing the real existential threat, which is the continued use of oil and fossil fuels fueling further climate change. So it's a desperate situation, devastating for many of us, uh, but we're not giving up hope. We can't give up hope, and we'll continue to fight as best we can. But does it have any immediate impact for the disease scanning within this paradigm, One Health? Is, is it, will it be trickier to identify things because climate change is suddenly, I, is, it, is it allowed to even say that it exists? Uh, it's not allowed by the federal government, but there's many states that are saying it. Right. So as you see the increased dysfunction of the federal government, the states are going to be taking more of an active role, and they already have been um, in uh, stepping up to the plate, if you will. So I guess the whole system of federalism, we are now going to see it work. Uh, California, for example, has got a huge economy, I think the sixth largest in the world, and the governor has declared that they're going to continue uh, with the climate agreement. So as more states, particularly the blue states, you know, continue, we have the larger economies. Um, we will continue to adhere to the climate accord. So don't lose, we can't lose hope, but, um, you know, it's, it was definitely a setback. Lalifa. Thanks. Um, this is a, it's going to take me several steps to get to my questions. Please bear with me. So related to the new administration, about 10 months ago, I think, there was a reinstatement of the global gag rule and even taking it further, where for people who don't know, this is removal of federal funding to local clinics that perform or even mention abortions in developing countries, in low middle income countries. I suspect, but I don't know, that many of the clinics in those parts of the world perform many functions, not just family planning, but also, importantly, disease surveillance of emerging outbreaks. Is anybody wondering or thinking about what that might have in terms of emerging zoonoses and how we surveil them and how we deal with them in timely fashion? Well, it's, it's certainly not going to help. No. Um, Is there research? Not that I'm aware of at this moment. I mean, I was waiting for the question about overpopulation. I was waiting for that one because I was prepared for it. Um, yes, I mean, that is, you know, the purple elephant in the room is, you know, we've got seven billion people. You know, the planet, how much can the planet support? Um, and I will go out onto a controversial limb here, if you will, and I would argue that um, the religious edict to be fruitful and multiply was very, uh, made sense 2,000 years ago, but I would argue is maladaptive today with over 7 billion people on the planet. So how to change that edict to be more adaptive, uh, to promote family planning and uh, women's health services and the education of women is a major strategy to try to get the human population at a more 
uh, uh, sustainable level than the trajectory that we are currently on. I don't have an easy answer for that. It would require a political and religious uh, um, attempt or uh, political and religious uh, reformation, if you will, in, in, a, in a socially acceptable way to make these changes. And unfortunately, even in the United States particularly, there's a resurgence of this conservative ideology of reducing the education of women, having them eliminating abortion services, family planning services. There's that movement afoot in our country that is, again, a step in the wrong direction for the survivability of civilization and the continued habitability of our planet. Um, so getting at the root of it then, yes, the government is doing these things, but the root of it is the religious, the religious part of it. That has to be adjusted, and I leave it to you to try and figure out. I don't have an answer for that because nobody wants to be told that their right to procreate is being infringed. So how do you address that? I don't know. Well, there might be economics. You gave us the figures on what it costs to sure. raise a child with Zika. And in many of the countries there, where, where Zika has a problem, abortion is completely outlawed. That's right. So that's right. That's an extra layer of complication. But do people often respond in a completely rational way? Yeah, that's the challenge we face. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have two questions, actually. The, one, the first one is, um, the ecosystem has its way of balancing things. So as human beings cut through forests uh, and getting viruses out, uh, could this be the nature's way of balancing things? Like, and then, uh, you know, maybe this is a more of a philosophical question. And the second question is the relation uh, between these viruses and autoimmune diseases. I'm from Turkey, and a couple of years ago we had this breakout of Crimean Congo uh, mm -hmm. hemorrhaging fever. It's a tick-borne disease. And I was listening to a presentation by a Turkish scholar who did like um, uh, research on this, and he actually connected it to the uh, autoimmune uh, diseases, uh, or the, 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 actually he mapped the geography and matched the uh, areas where people were more prone to have autoimmune diseases. I'm sorry, which kind of disease? Auto oh, autoimmune? autoimmune. Okay, yeah. So, uh, is there a link, in your opinion, between autoimmune diseases and like these viruses being uh, spreading around? Um, that's a great question. Probably. You know, there is some evidence that Zika is causing, is contributing to the increase in Guillain-Barre in certain individuals. I mean, Certainly the trigger can be by a virus. You have to have host susceptibility to it. I mean, people's immune systems are different. Um, and, and kind of in a related way, um, we're discovering increasingly that our microbiome plays an incredibly important role in health and disease. And there have been some evidence that our increasing use of antibiotics has contributed to more autoimmune diseases because you're killing the good with the bad bacteria. And so I would, you know, from a pure physiologic perspective, there's probably a much greater role by microbes in either contributing to autoimmune diseases and cancers than we know at this point. That's purely conjecture on my part, but the more we learn about it, the more you see all these connections happening. Um, so I would probably agree with you that that certainly could be uh, a role in that. What was your first question again? I don't remember. Uh, nature oh, the ecosystem. That's hard to say. I mean, um, you know, what we're doing to the planet, I mean, it's unprecedented. So is nature trying to rebalance? Well, I mean, the mosquitoes have to go somewhere. Uh, so they're, you know, they're going into human habit habitations. Um, and so you're seeing mosquitoes that might have preferred to uh, use uh, bird blood or animal blood. Uh, since those populations are decreasing, they're going to the next best thing, and that's humans. So they're going to you know, find some blood source um, to, to use. So that they're not going to go away. Is that an ecosystem rebalancing? I'm not sure that's you know, the way to describe it. Um, I, you know, 
I don't know. <laughs> so you said that the mosquitoes are the largest killer of humans, like on the planet. And I was thinking, well, there were talk. I heard, well, I read this economist article about uh, using, well, genetically modified organisms to like eliminate the mosquito, and like, I'm sort of like. I'm wondering about like the ethics of that and how like how would that uh, sort of work if, if that would ever work in your opinion. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, you know, it's interesting because of the because Brazil was hit hard with the microcephaly, they were very eager to release genetically modified male mosquitoes that were sterile into their environment to try and reduce that problem. Um, they wanted to release them in Florida, and there was a lot of political opposition to it. They didn't want it to be done, but we didn't have as much of the microcephaly problem as they did in Brazil. I think it depends on how bad the situation is and how scared people are, whether or not they're willing to take this leap and hoping that it's going to reduce their problem. Um, you know, and then the question is, well, what good are mosquitoes? I mean, why don't we just eliminate the whole lot of them from the planet? Well, there might be some unintended consequences. A lot of animals rely on mosquitoes for their food source. A lot of birds, a lot of bats. You know, bats are big consumers of mosquitoes, and we need bats for a lot of pollination services. So everything's kind of con connected. So yeah, I mean, it might sound great to do, you know, an intervention, but there's always unintended consequences that might not be what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a really tough call on whether to do it. And I think, you know, it's a political decision, and I think it depends on how outraged the public is, how much they're demanding something be done, and then you become desperate and are willing to do anything. You know, the political leaders ultimately have to make that decision, and I think it depends upon, you know, how many angry calls they get, and, you know, we're going to vote you out of office or whatever, and they're going to make some decision. Are there, is there anyone who wanted to ask a question whom I've missed? Good. Well, in that case, uh, I'd like to ask you to join me in, in thanking Laura for what, I, as I said at uh, the beginning, was a, a fascinating but in some ways rather disturbing talk. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Laura, thank you so much for it. My pleasure. Thank you for your time and attention. Pleasure for me.